Herbert and Marco, how are you doing? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Doing great. Would you like to share your screen to test it? Uh, yes, we can do that. Hi, Laura. Thanks so much for joining. Really appreciate it. Oh, nice seeing you. <laughs> you too. Okay, so let me... I think uh, we need to enable the screen sharing. Let me see. You are correct. Thank you. You're ready to go. We have a nice setting there in Florida. Yeah, it's not, it's not quite quite my office, but uh, you know, there's a spot like this. Yes. Laura, Laura how do you say your last name? Is it Marsu or or is that right? Marco. Marcou. Okay, great. I just want to make sure I had it right. Yeah, thanks so much again. I, I, I saw your, your, your talk on this in London at the Hamlin Symposium, and, and then uh, I talked to Oren a lot about it because he was a co-resident of mine at UCSF, and so we've been kind of sharing sharing stories about uh, some of these ideas. It's, it's really That's interesting. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to meet uh, Neurosurgeons on the other side of uh, <laughs> other cost. cost. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Okay, yeah, that looks good. And then when you're ready, you could just you, know, you could just uh, increase the size. Okay, so actually, yeah, before doing that, let me close this. Okay, so do you see it now? Yeah, that looks good. Okay, great. Yeah, I have uh, some slides I'm gonna start with and then you could just reshare your slides um, after the introduction. Okay. Perfect. So let me just pull mine up because we're just about to get started. Perfect. And, uh, you can put the music. We got one minute and we're going to get started, I guess. Okay, yeah, perfect. We are going live in five, four, three, two. Our webinar has started. Great, we'll just wait one minute for some people to join.
Okay, we'll get started while other people join, but uh, very excited uh, to welcome everybody to this month's Miami Global Brand Tumor Symposium. Uh, this is our 53rd uh, symposium, and uh, we're excited to continue this program with uh, my co-directors here at the University of Miami, uh, our brain tumor surgeons, Dr. Morcos, Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Komatar, and their contact information and, and uh, social media are, are linked here as well as the administration that really helps make this possible. Uh, we have support from University of Miami, the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, and of course, the Department of Neurosurgery. And uh, we really appreciate all the back behind the, the doors uh, action that they do every month to get these things uh, ongoing. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, tonight's symposium, you know they all are recorded and, and placed on YouTube. We have over now 15,000 views of our uh, prior uh, talks and uh, some really great comments on YouTube. So please be free to uh, check out the past symposiums on both brain tumors, skull based and cerebrovascular. And you can always find more information on social media or on our website. Um, so, and this is just a housekeeping. So uh, we have some panelists tonight from University of Miami, our surgical and research fellows, uh, Dr. Dagabadi, who's joining us here as our surgical uh, clinical neuro-oncology fellow, Dr. Barry, uh, also one of our fellows, uh, Dr. Morel, uh, another one of our fellows, and then Dr. Uh, Marazon is joining us uh, also as our research fellow uh, who has a interest in this topic. But tonight we welcome all the way from the West Coast, uh, Dr. Marcoux. Uh, we're really excited to hear her talk. I first uh, heard her talk uh, just uh, just not too long ago uh, while we were in London together at a medical robotics symposium called the Hamlin Symposium, and and her work really just kind of shined throughout the whole program to me. Um, and uh, interestingly, she works with one of my colleagues, Dr. Block, and together uh, they really try to set the new forefront for brain tumor surgery and extended resection for cancer margins. Uh, Dr. Marcou uh, joins us. She's a professor in biomedical engineering and neurological surgery uh, from University of California at Davis campus. Uh, she received her PhD in biomedical engineering at USC in Los Angeles, and her research interest is in the area of biomedical optics with a focus on research for the development of optical techniques for tissue diagnostics, including applications in oncology, interventional cardiology, and tissue engineering. She currently is a director of the National Center for Interventional Biophotonics uh, Technology. And since 2007, she serves as a co-director for the Comprehensive Cancer Center on Biomedical Technology uh, Program at the UC uh, Davis Medical Center. She's authored more than 200 articles and is an editorial board for the Journal of Biophotonics and Translational Biophotonics, and also the associate editor for Biomedical Optic Express. She also has multiple NIH uh, funds supporting her lab, which you could see here, and uh, in some amazing work that she's done thus far. And we're really excited for her to take out the time for afternoon and join us here on the East Coast and, and share some of her work. So thank you so much, Laura, for joining us tonight. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It is my, my pleasure to uh, be in Florida now. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen. Um, you could just share it. I think um, you may need to stop sharing yours so I can share mine. Yeah, I think you can. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Great. Okay. Great. So thank you again for um, the opportunity to uh, present uh, here today. And my talk is going to be about some of our efforts on translating or moving a fluorescence lifetime spectroscopy imaging technique into a clinical environment to help uh, with surgical decision making. So I'd like to put actually this in a broader perspective first. So practically when entering the operating room, probably you as uh, surgeons, uh, know better than me uh, that the surgeon's information is often limited to patient's medical history, uh, physical exam, uh, laboratory values, and standard radiology. And ultimately, to what the surgeon see with their own eyes uh, and the information process with their own brain. 
And in many clinical scenarios, uh, more detailed information regarding the biochemical, structural, or metabolic nature of relevant tissues would be helpful not only for making a diagnosis, but most importantly, for choosing the optimal treatment. And ideally, uh, this um, information could be provided in real time within the procedure or patient management workflow and an easily interpretable form that will be transformative for clinical management on patients and could ultimately lead to a personalized intervention and optimized patient outcome. And here is where we see the opportunity for light-based technologies uh, or intraoperative optical imaging to make a difference in clinical management of cancer and ultimately patient outcomes, a patient who suffer with love and have uh, tumors. So today I will talk about one of these techniques, um, in particular fluorescence spectroscopy and imaging. So fluorescence imaging has actually uh, emerged as a promising method for guiding intervention since it provides real-time guidance. It is cost-efficient um, and also allow for a flexible implementation. Fluorescence practically can guide the human eyes beyond the natural limitations by leveling in contrast provided by the endogenous or exogenous fluorescence markers. And yet, despite the significant advantages in this field, clinical adoption of fluorescence systems for guided interventions remains limited. So why is that? Um, first, the current instrumentation that is used uh, relies on intensity or spectral measurements, which makes me a subject to, which is a practically an inherent limitation of this technique as absolute intensity measurement or spectral measurement are not possible in a clinical and, and challenging environment. So provided that we can measure the fluorescence lifetime or the time the molecules will spend on excited state uh, before uh, um, emitting light, then we probably can overcome some of these limitations and also enhance the molecular specificity with a caveat that measurements of fluorescence lifetime, these lifetimes of uh, endogenous markers or even exogenous markers are very, very short, or the nanoseconds or a billion of the second. So these techniques uh, actually have proven to be very, very useful in benchtop systems uh, using classical microscopes where studies can be done more, more easily in cell culture, on spheroids, or even in small animals. And that research led to breakthrough uh, discoveries related to metabolic uh, function uh, through this metabolic imaging approach using FLIM, drug efficiency studies, drug efficiency, and also in neurobiology. But yet, uh, the clinical utility of these fluorescence lifetime techniques or time resolve measurements remains uh, largely unexplored. And this is uh, practically because these techniques require complex, well, complex instrumentation, as I say, measuring these very fast decays require a more complicated instrumentation and also uh, will require large data acquisition and analysis time. So my laboratory has been focused for several years, for many years now actually, on um, finding solutions that can translate this fluorescence lifetime system from a bench tap to a clinical environment. And for that, we work on a variety of, uh, of um, problems, which will allow this data to be actually not only fast recorded, but also analyzed and augmented. Uh, we can acquire data from a, a variety of geometries and conditions and also are safe. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the approach that we have in our lab in order to make all this happen. So in brief, uh, this is very technical uh, for the audience, but just to give you a sense of how, how this works. Practically, you, we have a pulse laser and you send the light through a fiber optic to the tissue and collect the fluorescence light with the same fiber optic 
which is spectrally uh, resolved using a set of uh, filters and dichroic, and then that time multiplex on one detector. And then these signals are digitized. And as you can see, since we have four spectral bands here, we can resolve the decays of fluorescence in these four spectral bands, which can be tailored to, to, to different molecular species of interest. It, the, different tissues will have different molecular species. And in this case, uh, um, uh, mostly we look at uh, collagen or elastin or the structured proteins in one channel, NADH or FAD, which are the enzyme cofactor in polycellular metabolism, and porphyrins. And for each point measurement, we can actually um, extract a range of parameters. So practically, you have a, a plurality of information that comes from each pixel or point measurements. And this can be done very, very fast. And this technique is insensitive to room light. Therefore, we can collect data and actually augment it, as I'm going to show next, uh, on um, not necessarily turning of the um, light. So here it's an implementation that also takes advantage of, and it takes advantage of uh, uh, cameras which exist in the operating room or uh, additional cameras if needed, where we can actually in inject through the same fiber optic that is used to excite and collect fluorescence, an aiming beam. And this aiming beam is seg uh, segmented and then we can augment the fluorescence parameters of interest directly on the surgical field of view as we can see in this movie. And uh, this platform allows us also to track the tissue light exposure, we can, we can see uh, where actually you perform the measurement at any time. And uh, again, can overlay directly uh, information about the biochemical features of tissues, which uh, the surgeon will operate on. So, um, and these are two generation of instrumentation just developed in our lab. Uh, most of the data that I'm going to present today is obtained with this generation one system. We have a new system, which is now in current in, in clinics, which has more performance features. We also have developed a range of fiber optic probes, which can be adapted to collect uh, uh, or to integrate our technique with either a surgical robot or can be used for uh, brain biopsy guidance can be also a standalone probes with some distal optics that allow us to uh, better uh, excite or collect, collect light from tissue and also can be integrated with neural navigation system. So these probes are very, very tiny with a diameter uh, around 300 micrometers to, to 300 micrometers and uh, with an NAF 0.2 and, and with that, I'm going to move to two applications that I'm going to discuss today. One is the integration of this technique with transoral robotic surgery for um, uh, detection and delineation of head and neck cancer. And the second is, which probably is more of interest to, uh, to your group in neurosurgery for a delineation of primary uh, uh, brain cancer. So I'll start with the first application. Uh, the head and neck squamous cell carcinoma is located in oral cavity, but also can be uh, located in oral pharynx. And uh, it can be triggered by a variety of, of uh, factors, including uh, exposure to HPV. So the surgical goal in this case is to remove the tumor amplite plus uh, safety healthy margins, which per standard of care is about three to five millimeters. So the idea is to um, minimize the um, possibility of recurrence by removing this uh, healthy tissue uh, surrounding the tumor. Most of now, because as I mentioned earlier, our interest is in integration of our technique with, uh, uh, with surgical robotics. And in this particular case, uh, with, uh, uh, for transoral robotic surgery, the challenge when the robot is used is that not only um, uh, the fact that 
the surgeon has only visual cues, but also um, are lacking the tactile feedback, which typically they use in this type of surgeries. Plus the geometries are quite complicated when it comes to uh, the base of tongue or um, tonsils back on uh, oral pharynx. So uh, this is our instrument. We can, we can integrate both software and hardware with the uh, robot. Practically, we can have the fiber optic, which is connected to our instrument, can be placed through, um, connected to surgical instrument, or can be manipulated using, uh, in this case, a Maryland forceps across the tissue surface that needs to be uh, scanned directly by the surgeons from the surgeon console. And uh, this work is in collaboration with uh, Intuitive Surgical. And uh, as you'll see in this video, this is uh, the integration with one of the surgical platforms which allow again manipulation of this fiber optic from the surgeon console. What you see here is the augmentation of one of these fluorescence parameters, in this case emission of 470 nanometers on a surgical field of view. And this heat map indicates uh, tumors region versus uh, uh, normal. We, since we have acquired data from multiple patients, now we can start developing classifier. And ultimately the goal is not necessarily to augment just one parameter at the time, but rather to augment the probabilistic classifiers as you can see in this video. So in this way, the surgeons can have direct visual cues of the surgical margins or the probability of having cancer at the margins. So for that, uh, this is a very, very long uh, study, uh, but I'm going to just discuss a little bit some of the challenges that we are trying to address. And one is related with um, uh, mapping or coupling the each fluorescence parameter with the histopathology from each point or data point or pixel where we do these measurements. So we develop processes that allows us to, to map um, the histology back to in vivo um, area that from where measurements were taken. We also developed, started to develop a range of classifiers using different methods, either parameter-based, a support vector machine, or a deep learning like CNN, in order to uh, be able to see how well we can resolve the tumor from normal tissue. And this is the original initial classifier, which was developed using a data set from 50 patients, uh, which led to an uh, ROC AUC of 0.88. And this, uh, interestingly enough, uh, when we use this initial classifier to see if we can identify, this is a completely different data set, uh, the um, uh, unknown primary, I don't know if you're familiar with, but the known primary in head and neck cancer are traffic tumors, uh, which actually the, uh, the surgeons or the physician will know the tumor uh, is present uh, because it's spread to the lymph node, but cannot be identified um, prior to the surgery or the time of the surgery uh, through the radiologic images or visual inspection. So the idea is to identify uh, on epithelial surface where actually the tumor is located. So here's our um, uh, uh, great surprise is that using the classifier developed on those previous 50 patients uh, and uh, applied to patients with a known primary, we're able actually to uh, resolve or to identify areas of uh, tumors with high uh, sensitivity and specificities, but a particular sensitivity, but also were able to correctly demarcate entire benign tissue, which indicates to surgeons that tissue suspect of occult primary are uh, involved um, with carcinoma. So this was a pilot study in, in six patients and we have reported um, uh, um, 
about half a year uh, back. So currently, uh, the, our database have increased. Actually, in fact, uh, so this moment, we have close to 150 patients. Analysis I'm going to show here is uh, from um, a database about 92 patients, where now we can account from also different anatomical locations of these tumors and see whether accounting from, from this anatomical location, we can actually better or improve the classifier. So one of my postdoc is working on uh, developing these classifiers and these are preliminary data, which shows that uh, using ensemble learning approaches uh, and accounting by the site where the tumor is located, we can actually increase the uh, uh, AUCROC from 0.88 that I showed earlier to over 90%, to 94%, and also, we can use the sun classifier to distinguish between healthy cancer and dysplasia. So another problem that we are working and will be facing in certain patients is the ability to one, augment practically this uh, probabilistic classifiers, but also we need to do that by accounting for tissue motion which uh, is generated by the respiration, pulsation, or even camera motion. So we are developing methods that actually, if you look on this image, you'll see the tissue moving underneath and the image uh, being static. And uh, after applying these algorithms for motion correction, and if you look closely, you'll notice that uh, the uh, image uh, uh, the augmentation moves with um, uh, playing this again, moves with the tissue underneath. So in this way, we can have a more accurate registration of these classifiers on the tissue surface. So this data is now um, analysis or projection of the classifiers done offline and we're working on algorithms which can do this in real time at the time of the procedure. So in summary, when it comes to um, uh, TORS, um, we have, have success successfully integrated our print system with the DaVinci Surgical Platform. And um, that visualization of these parameters can be done at 30 Hertz. The, um, robotic platform. Um, the system is currently agnostic of the robotic, robotic platform. It can be in a single port or multiple pro ports. So it, it, regardless of um, the new uh, upcoming robotic platforms, we can actually adapt this uh, instrumentation. And also we started to have methods that accounts for tissue motion and provides an accurate registration. Another uh, aspect, uh, we started to implement methods for labeling imaging data and registration of histology. And this data is generated or the databases will account now for distinct tissues of um, uh, the location of this tumor in the tongue, tonsil, but also heter heterogeneities, ulceration, lymphoid, and so on and so forth. And also we have starting to uh, study whether uh, the presence of the tumor type origin, either is HPV derived smoking or drinking will also affect the way the classifiers are performing. We also started to demonstrate the diagnostic value of these film parameters and the ability to actually dissolve in real time the uh, normal tissue from uh, the, um, the surrounding normal healthy from the tumor and apply a variety of methods, including deep learning and AI in order to uh, develop these uh, classifiers. And another area we're working currently is to couple the preoperative uh, imaging parameters or so radiomics with intraoperative uh, parameters from FLIM to actually uh, that determine whether this combination of parameters can help with um, 
detection uh, or identification patients where these tumors are spread to the lymph nodes or to use this combination of parameters to better uh, delineate uh, the margins of the tumor. And with that, I'm going to move to the next application, which is uh, on neurosurgery. And I, I think that will be probably more of, of um, interest to, to you. So probably as you um, all know, um, at the other end um, is that uh, traditionally this uh, primary brain cancer is classified as low grade or high grade gliomas. And um, the surgical goal here, in contrast with the head and neck, is to not only remove the tumor as much as possible without damaging the normal brain tissue, but the approach here is that the removal of, is what I'm learning from my colleagues here, neurosurgeon, is typically done in uh, layers, like a piecemeal removal. The tumor is removed from the center toward the edges. And therefore, it is important to identify those infiltrative ages at the time of the procedure. So the current approaches to actually guide this uh, surgery is to have or to use the preoperative uh, images in order to plan the surgery and through the neural navigation system to actually locate the tumor and help you navigate inside the, the brain. And the surgery uh, also understood is done under the surgical microscope with white light. And uh, this is uh, the uh, typical uh, method. And more recently, with the approval of 5LA, uh, induce, uh, which, uh, this can induce the PP9 fluorescence. You can actually visualize these tumors with VRI to look at the fluorescence of the 5LA under um, excitation. So the challenge is, as you all know, there is no mean for real time. When I'm talking real time, it is instantaneous detection of tumor at the resection margin. And the, the tool that we currently have is practically this frozen sections that takes time in order to get the confirmation back. And when you use 5LA, induce PP9, uh, this is typically limited to glioblastoma, and this is also qualitative imaging because it's an assessment with the bare eye based on the intensity of the fluorescence that is sensed by the human eye. So um, here is now how our system uh, integrated with uh, in a neuro on surgery uh, workflow. You can see our instrumentation here. Also the surgical microscope and the neural navigation system. So you can also see the scanning of a small area. Augmentation of parameters, then we can take a microbiopsy from that location that can be mapped. Then, using uh, the location, using the neural navigation pointer, and actually localize and go back to the MRI coordinates. So, in this way, we can actually have a um, registration of the few parameters. As you can see here, FLIM acquisition, we have uh, the microbiopsy and the analysis, the diagnostic that comes both from classical histopathology, but also molecular analysis from the location. And eventually we can map this back to the MRI um, uh, preoperative scan so we can have the whole, whole picture. So um, now we're on the process of addressing three, three questions. Uh, one is that, as you probably know, there is a new approach to classifying the adult type diffuse uh, gliomas, where, um, which goes through um, uh, less aggressive to more aggressive from oligodendroglioma and astrocytoma, both being IDH mutant and the glioblastoma, which is wild type. So the 
where if this is graded, practically some of the astrocytoma like grade four, as you know, will be coupled with a, a, a glioblastoma in a old classification, whereas this new one allows us to stratify better the uh, origin of the tumor and eventually relate that information with our uh, FLIM parameters or FLIM system, which is sensitive to molecular changes. So there are three questions again that we are working on right now. One is to uh, um, evaluate whether we can actually distinguish between the two types of IDH mutant, mutant tumors, so oligodendrogliomas versus astrocytoma, where oligodendrogliomas are less invasive uh, or less, um, so can uh, respond better to uh, radio uh, chemotherapy, therefore the treatment could be also different. There are different st uh, strategies of treating these patients. And eventually that could be lead leading to a different surgical strategies as well. The second question is um, on uh, can FLIM detect infiltrative ages, uh, the resection margins and predict tumor cellularity density. So it's not just detecting the tumor, but also resolving whether uh, we have um, high or low uh, cellularity of the margins. And the third question, can we use actually film system to enhance uh, the ability of detecting the PP9 uh, fluorescence? So uh, these are some brief results on uh, quick results. On this analysis, uh, this study, um, uh, we have a manuscript which is in uh, uh, submitted and uh, we just got the reviews back. As you can see here uh, in this, this uh, image, uh, practically we noted that oligodendroglioma have very different characteristics when we look at the metabolic channels. 470 and 540 nanometers. These are related with NADH and FAD fluorescence. And um, this data is done on um, tumor infiltrated in a white matter. And oligodendroglioma, again, it's very clearly distinguished from, from the normal white matter. Astrocytoma uh, has show, have shown so far lower discrimination, but still can be discrimination uh, between normal and disease characteristics. There are other parameters that are used to, to practically discriminate these features. So um, practically what we learned from this study, a preliminary study in, um, I think we have here uh, 10 patients, the label free flim could be a biomarker of low grade ADH mutant tumor, and we can distinguish between oligo and astrocytomas, which typically have a biological and uh, different biological uh, behavior. And uh, this can be done in situ and can eventually lead to personalized action or clinical treatment. The second question, as I mentioned, also this is work in, in progress. Um, is to detect this infiltrative age of GBM. And um, the pathologist we are working on is practically classifying and looking at both molecular features, but also H and stain, in order to um, evaluate uh, the cellularity, uh, which is grouped now in three, three categories, absent, low, moderate, and high. And uh, in this preliminary data, you can see now in the left image, this is the lifetime on the three spectral bands. The lifetime will decrease with increased tumor cell density, as you can see on this, this uh, image. And also this is associated with a spectral shift where the, um, with increased tumor cell density, you will notice a red shift in uh, metabolic channels. So this preliminary 
data indicates that this individual flip parameter, so this is not a classifier here yet, provides uh, optical contrast between areas with distinct tumor cellularity and practically resolving uh, to uh, some degree the infiltrative zone. And on this rather small data set at this moment, we start looking at some uh, classifier uh, based on um, linear discriminant analysis to see if we can discriminate between high and low tumor cell densities. So this very basic classification model combines FLIM data which distinguishes areas of high and low tumor density and practically indicates the possibility of detecting positive surgical margins in real time. And uh, the third question was whether we can actually translate uh, this quality, qualitative visualization of PP9 fluorescence, which is induced for, by 5LA. As you may recognize here, this is a conventional fluorescence uh, microscopy image, uh, which is a wide field visualization. Uh, typically, you have the room lights turned down when you look at these images and uh, is primarily used for uh, the hydrates and uh, underperforms in the low grades or not even used to detect the, in the patients with low grade gliomas. And here is uh, our system, which is now adapted in order to sense the fluorescence of PP9. And you can see that when you scan, you have a change in fluorescence lifetime across the area where um, actually this is the same, the same area uh, which was visualized with a microscope, which indicates that we can actually have a more quanti a qualitative assessment of PP9. And importantly, these images are taken a room light, so allow practically a resection in parallel um, with the visualization of the presence of PP9. And moreover, uh, since uh, we can collect fluorescence in multiple spectral channels, we can also look simultaneously at the autofluorescence properties of the tissue. In this case, in this image, you see the uh, emission on an NADH channel. And we can actually use the same uh, technique as a research tool, not only as a clinical tool to better understand the uh, interaction uptake of um, if it use of molecular probes or interaction of these probes with metabolic pathways in, in cells. And again, this can be done directly in patients. So in summary, um, we, based on this new uh, uh, H, uh, WHO classification, we are able now to fine tune uh, the way we can uh, analyze your data to find whether we can sense um, with more higher uh, molecular specificity the uh, different type of tumors. Uh, for the IDH, uh, mutant tumor inside the tissue classification could modify clinical and surgical strategies according with the tumor type. And for IDH wild type, the detection of infiltrative ages enable optimization of the ex extent of the resection for improved sur survival rates. And in the case of uh, 5LA, uh, we actually um, started to demonstrate that we can have the possibility to increase the sensitivity on visualizing the fluorescence of um, this, this um, the PP9. We can improve the detection of the infiltrative ages. And also we can use this technique as both the clinical and um, uh, research tool. So now if you were to ask me what are the um, three biggest successes of um, this uh, uh, technology, practically now we have a platform, uh, iFlim platform, which can be integra integrated in different surgical environments, including robotic surgery, neural navigation, but also with uh, rotational catheters. Actually, uh, um, we can acquire this data. I see here on uh, fly through from uh, human uh, coronary arteries. So this data can be also acquired in a, uh, in 
cylindric from a cylindrical structures, uh, if needed. And uh, also in terms of uh, uh, analysis, we have methods that allow for fast analysis of this information and also displaying this information in real time, including motion correction. And also uh, we started to use this in a variety of, of um, uh, applications from head and neck to brain cancer. We also have studies uh, in uh, breast cancer and um, uh, other, other types of cancer. And as you saw in this fly through, we are also interested in uh, uh, looking at uh, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis. We also have developed a uh, range of core competencies from design, fabrication, and testing of these devices to uh, machine learning and AI that allows us to um, analyze uh, informally this data and also clinical evaluation. So um, I would like to, to um, close with um, current challenges and future solutions. Practically, uh, one of the key challenges uh, at the moment is not necessarily bringing this instrumentation in the operating theater and uh, acquiring data, but rather is our ability to register the optical signal or validate them against the gold standard. So it's very important to build a team science where the engineers, physicists, surgeons, biologists, and the pathologists practically work together on developing these rigorous end-to-end -end methodologies. One is to establish the relationship between optical parameters and tissue phenotype, and the second to account for biological diversity uh, of uh, tissue. And the second is uh, standardization. These clinical studies uh, at the moment are inefficient. It's a lengthy process. And to, to make this more efficient process um, would require a quality management framework, calibration standards, standard operation procedure, data management, management and sharing. And this probably will uh, require multi-institutional clinical studies within identical devices for fast tracking uh, the collection of data to demonstrate clinical value of these new devices especially when it comes to the label-free approaches, we'll have to have many, many patients in order to validate the technology. And with that, um, I hope I convince you that um, fluorescence lifetime imaging uh, can play a role in, in the clinical environment. And fluorescence lifetime is not alone. There are other optical techniques that can play a role in characterization of uh, biochemical, functional and structural features of local pathologies at the time of the procedure. And when combined with uh, preoperative imaging or parametric analysis or idiomics, uh, and also with parameters which are derived from each patient, this could eventually lead to a more personalized intervention in, in patients. And I think that our optical community can make a difference not only on developing this clinically compatible imaging uh, systems uh, for diagnostic purpose, but also on immersing them within the procedure and integrating them in the procedure workflow to provide immediately useful information that is specific to the individual patient and the situation. And some of these efforts will be pursued under this new center that was awarded to UC Davis. National Center for Intervention of Aquatonic Technologies, which has the mission to promote public health by advancing a new technological paradigm for in intraprocedural image guided decision making. And our vision is to create scalable, easily deployable, readily interface optical technologies within an integrative platform capable of transforming patient management. And with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge. Uh, many people who contributed to this work, and of course, the support that we have from industry partners, uh, Cancer Center, and uh, of course, uh, NIH. Thank you very much for, for your attention.
Thanks so much. That was a that was a great talk. Really, really exciting stuff. I think that's really the way of the future is to get more data to the surgeons during surgery to kind of actually quantitate and uh, make these critical decisions. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience before we get to our panelists. Uh, Nicholas Ruiz asks, you know, what is the role and in, in involvement of computer uh, computational neuroscientists? for all of the kind of evaluation that, that you've done here? So, um, we are not necessarily working with computational neuroscientists. We are working with um, uh, data scientists and uh, image, uh, image processing, um, signal processing, and more recently with AI deep learning classification models takes advantage of uh, uh, the um, uh, deep learning methods and AI rather than standard uh, yeah, statistics that is used in analyzing this data. So this is what we're currently exploring, how we can extract more information by accounting for the, um, or more precise information uh, account in, of the biological diversity of these tissues. But of course, this will involve increasing the, the database in order to be able to account for all, all possible variables or almost the, at least the most important ones that yeah. will affect this data. Okay, um, Martin, Alexis, any questions? Great talk. I was it was really interesting. Um, I do have I do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is uh, if you if there is any exclusion criteria in terms of like patient patient selection, or all patients can be included. So all patients are currently included uh, because we like to learn whether um, what are the conditions features uh, which will influence our data. For example, um, and this is something that will be uh, reporting on some of the pilot study that we conducted on uh, GBM and infiltrative ages, we noticed that if you look at the new uh, uh, gliomas and other recurrent gliomas, there are different features in one versus the other. So it's clearly more heterogeneity at the margins when you have uh, recurrence. And vis-a-vis uh, -vis to the new gliomas. So not only the um, tumor type, but also whether that was a recurrence or not may influence this labor-free uh, data. So also we are looking whether the uh, some of these tumors are now located on metabolically active areas, especially we notice that it's more difficult to resolve uh, the tumors in certain conditions when they're on, situated in a cortex versus white matter is more consistent and more easy to do it in a white matter rather than cortex. So there, there is a range of variables that we started to learn may influence this data and have to have a large database in order to be able to account for, for all those. So yes, we do include um, all patients and see uh, how the data turns out and see uh, whether it can be grouped together based on disease or have to account for different conditions under which um, the data was acquired or the patient condition. Thank you. And my second question is actually, um, how do you think that necrosis and ischemia can influence this type of fluorescence? Oh, definitely. Uh, so actually we did study the um, uh, necrosis. So I have uh, a paper published in animal studies, which was kind of controlled necrosis induced, but also in patients. Necrotic tissue has very different characteristics than uh, normal brain. Uh, or even tumor, and it's an increased lifetime with notice on the metabolic channels. Uh, also in some conditions, probably because of the formation of some, some um, 
kind of matrix derived structures. We see also fluorescence on a different spectral channel. So that, that is easy to distinguish the necrotic areas. When it comes to hypoxy condition, yes, that's another variable that can be uh, studied because if you look at the NADH channel and FAD channel, only the reduced form of NADH of fluorescence, not the oxidized form, and it's vice versa for the FAD. So practically the fluorescence, first of all, the fluorescence intensity is directly related with the tissue oxygenation or cellular uh, oxygenation. Then the second uh, is that when an ADH is bounded to proteins, we'll have a different fluorescence lifetime decay when uh, relative to the free form. So always will be a, 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 a balance or a ratio between free bound and ADH that can be studied. Um, and that could be related with metabolic pathways as well. So yes, that's, the answer is yes, we can study both of those necrosis and oxygenation for hypoxia using autofluorescence. Thank you. Great, Martin. Yes, hi. Uh, well, yeah, I find uh, really fascinating the process of taking new technology from the lab to the, to the OR, so mo even more looking for significant clinical impact. So, uh, my question was to uh, was if if did you observe any difference in relating to accuracy detecting low grade tumors versus high grade tumors like we see when we use the Favia LA? So, um, in the context of Favia LA, no, no, with this uh, regarding the fluorescence, if you. If you notice any difference uh, regarding the accuracy for detecting low grade tumors uh, yeah. in comparison to high grade? Yeah, so the low, low grades are much easier to detect. It's more consistent. Um, and this is not on just these recent studies because I'm working on this area for quite a bit. I started when I was still a Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles many years back. And uh, this is the four instrument that we use in the operating room as point spectroscopy initially, and now the scanning approach, we use clinical frame. On all of them, we notice that uh, the low grades can be distinguished quite well. When it comes to the high grade, the GBM, the heterogeneity, you have features from the center to the margins. And now we started to notice that even if it's recurrent or it's a new tumor or different features. Um, yeah, so we can still distinguishing uh, it, but um, the um, sensitivity sometimes is, is problematic because, uh, or the specificity. So low grades, I would say, would, um, would work very well, would not have a problem in a, in a label free. The high grade, I think, will require, or the GBM in particular, will require more study to understand how a variety of conditions that may influence the um, biology uh, are reflected in our signal because we are very sensitive to, to metabolism, to biochemical features, um, a lot more sensitive probably than classical pathology. So there is a, this is the reason we are going now to molecular analysis to better understand the relationship with uh, genetic markers, molecular markers that may play a role in the signals that we detect. Right. Uh, Lakash? Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Marku. Uh, that was a brilliant talk and, uh, you know, really expands on the current uh, availability in the OR. You know, as you discussed, this is the primarily used to uh, attain margins in, in interaxial tumors, which, you know, historically 
you know, we're just starting to expand upon with fluorescence and as well as uh, uh, your intraoperative techniques. Now, how in, in the operating room, how often do you feel the surgeons are utilizing this technique um, to attain the margin, to check for the margins? Because, you know, one of the things about 5ALA is it's fluorescing everything at once. Um, and this, uh, my understanding is it's, it's getting the surface of the tumor. So how often are they using it uh, continuously? So just um, to, so we, we use now this technique, we started as a label free with no 5LA. Mm -hmm. But now more recently, because Dr. Black I'm collaborating with Warren is very interested on the 5LA aspect as well. We adapted the technique to look also for the 5LA induced PP9. Actually what is detected is the PP9 fluorescence. 5LA okay. induces the, the, the the PP9 fluorescence. And um, the most of my previous studies are done label free with no 5 LA at all. But more recently, we are again adapted to, and we have a few cases started with 5 LA. Uh, we're expecting an NIH grant, which will be focused on the 5 LA alone, to practically look at uh, one. How can we increase the specificity the, or the sensitivity on detecting the 5LA, especially the resection margins? That, because you, you have these grades of um, ready, and it's very difficult to, to distinguish at the margin. But with our technique, we have much higher um, specificity for, for the 5LA. And we can, we can detect it also. Uh, at the time we, the room light with the yeah, room lights turned on. So you can actually reject while you see it. Mm -hmm. So it's not like on and off and remember where the red was before. <laughs> so, um, so that's one, one thing from the practical point of view, but is the more qualitative assessment of the margins, whether uh, the signal comes from 5LA or is from, from something else. Uh, and this is what I'm going to study for the GBM. And, and also another problem I understand from literature is that 5LA is not used on the low grades anymore because yeah. there is no specificity. But maybe uh, because we are more, more sensitive to this signal, so it's not the bare eye, it's practically a detector, which is much sensitive than the human eye on detecting the, this fluorescence. Will we be able to detect low levels of the, the PP9? Because apparently there is a low level of PP9 induced by 5LA mm -hmm. in the low grades. So you still have it, but it's not visible to the human eye. And this is something that we're also going to study whether we can detect the fluorescence in the low grades. And Absolutely. I think this may expand it to multiple other tumors because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Ivan, the, the fluorescence, the 5 LA can go into other tumors as well. It's just, is it enough for the human eye to catch is the concern? Yeah, yes. Exactly. Yeah, the 5 LA uh, has a long history. So all this, um, Porphyrin uh, molecular probe that induces the porphyrin fluorescence goes back to photodynamic therapy. So, so many, many studies in this space, um, which is actually going exponentially up at some point, now decline and now started to pick up again. Uh, and um, yeah, it's a uh, fascinating area to, to go back with new instrumentation, new approaches to understand uh, how we can use the 5LA for visualization, but ultimately, uh, can we also treat? Because, yeah, some of these probes or initially develop as uh, um, therapeutic agents, not uh, imaging necessarily. So we can visualize and also treat simultaneously. Great, thank you. you. Yeah, another quick question I had was, um, you know, and it's just really amazing work, and especially that you've done it in now different body areas with different such different tumor types. But uh, from that experience, I was just wondering if the CNNs that you have developed for the machine uh, learning algorithms 
are they significantly different when you're looking at squamous cell in the tongue versus, you know, the GBM versus a low grade? And do you think you're going to have to make some assignment uh, to kind of what algorithm you're going to use for what the expected tumor is going to be to really make that specificity and sensitivity the most accurate? Yeah, so this, this is, uh, in brain, I don't think with this new approach and systematic approach, we have enough data or patients to, to look at all these variables. But in head and neck, we um, have more data uh, and we're able to account for at least three uh, tumors which are placed on a base of tongue, um, uh, tonsil and also oral tongue because basal tongue and oral tongue have different composition. And when we account for the um, anatomy or the location of the tumor, we are able to improve the classifier. Uh, and these are things that we started because we have this larger database to account for. So yes, the answer is that having the ability to account for this biological variables and plug them in in this machine learning algorithms, that definitely helps. And but then you have to play with a database or a strain. The challenge in that another challenge which I haven't talked about is the unbalanced data. Because typically you have, when it comes to pathology, you have more data from tumor and maybe not so much from normal because right. you guys don't want to take the normal tissue out. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and all the, the normal tissue is different. I mean, you have mucosa from the tongue, mucosa from yeah. the tonsil. Yeah. You know, you have nasal mucosa, bone eventually, and, and nerves and in the skull base. And these are all going to be different data sets that are compared yeah. contrast from, which are going to be challenging. Yes. So and also this algorithms that we initially developed actually is a paper that just goes on for the head and neck now uh, on this 90 patient uh, is that um, the, um, this is for the epithelial surface. Okay. When you go to D margins, it's a completely different picture because the D margins is no epithelial structure there. There you have to go with the muscle, fat, or whatever is underneath and account for that. And the other challenge is the cautery, depending how you cut the tumors, that may influence the um, um, composition of tissue. Yeah, that was my next question was, you know, your surgeries that you showed were also clean, uh, no blood, no charring and whatnot. And I wanted to know, you know, how, how that affects sometimes when you're operating and you have fluid that's running down or charring and, and you know, does that kind of yeah. just say, you know, does it, does it read as just undiagnostic or does it try to yeah. understand what it is? Well, the, the the fluid doesn't affect the signal. So, and usually you can use suction probes. It's, that's not not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so only okay. So there are in a head and neck. We are talking about epithelial surface because they want to have the initial incision. Usually, they take this three to five millimeters safety margin. This is the standard of care. And if these tumors are in place on some functional areas, then they have to strike this balance, impairing, you know, especially tongue or whatever it is. Um, you want to balance with the quality of life of that patient. So you don't want to remove too much tissue. So that border, which they don't know if the tumor is extended, it's a pill cancerization, it's a low grade, it's a high grade. This is what can help. There is no blood in that case. When it comes to the D margin, that's a completely different story because now you do have blood, you can clean the blood, that's no problem because if they put some fluid and they do the suction, we can get the data. Uh, the cautery is the problem 
because right. that would be the bone tissue. And we are working now, uh, this is another, um, yeah, we're working on how we can resolve the cautery. Is the cautery having distinctive features? Can yeah. we detect the tumor, which is in the cauterized area, if it's left? Of course, the challenge is that there are not too many cases like this because if the surgery is done properly, then very few patients will have that positive margin right. in order to, to analyze and to detect the, um, to build a, data, a robust database. Sure. So that's, sure. we have a hundred something, 50 now, and I don't know, probably only less than 10 will have that deep margin uh, positive. Sure. So the surgeons are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then when it comes to brain, I think there's no, um, yeah, we, uh, the surgeon seems to uh, clean the blood uh, and we can still get data. And it's also a very small area. If you notice the way we build the database right now in comparison with the past is practically having this microbiopsy Right. And we have one-on-one -on -one relationship between uh, the uh, area or we detect or measure with our system versus the pathological analysis, which in head and neck is more challenging because you have to do all this cross-section and you have deformations and that's... Uh, right. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah, not but, an easy it... process. I think that the, the the margin zone of you know head and neck cancer tends to be more narrowed than than gliomas, where you have more of this diffuse invasion yeah. and this very prolonged gradient of high density to low density cells. That I think in your point when you at the end, which I think was really exciting, I mean not really important was just the this idea of standardization of what we're controlling these this technology to, and are we all reporting the same kind of you know, accuracy numbers that are correlated to the same thing is going to be so critical because even with the gold standard, it's hard to pick up, you know, a few cells in a, in a slide or in a biopsy. And eventually as this technology improves, you may end up being able to detect things better than, than on a slide and, and how, but how do you, show, how do you show that? How do you show yeah, that yes. that's, that's exactly. really, that's really the case and that what you're detecting is actually more accurate than our ability to stain for these tumor cells, which, you know, it's it's quite challenging in some cases to stain for those cells. Yes. So so in so for gliomas now, how are you deciding when you have those, you know, what is the threshold for tumor or no tumor? Is it a percentage or is it uh, is it just related to a pathologist saying low density, high density tumor, or is it uh, um, uh, what is what is what is that threshold number? Yeah, so, so right now for this, um, high, again, we are not changing the clinical uh, care at this moment. We are practically doing retrospective studies right, right. where we get the data, we do the pathology, and we see how well we can detect it. The next step, once, once we have, when we trust the classifiers, then we'll be able to do prospective studies. Where we get the data, the surgeon can see the diagnostic, which is another thing that we have to get the FDA approval because right now it's easy to do the studies in humans because it's a non-significant risk device. Right. And, and uh, the surgeon is not influenced by our data in making decisions. But in a prospective study, that might be, uh, I would not say a problem, but this is something to, to take into account that the surgeon will steal the diagnostic, will, will make that, will be confirmed by the pathology. So that will be more closer to a realistic conditions will not still the surgeon will not make the decision on our data until the, we go through all the FDA approval. Uh, but this is a C, uh, before the pathology, whether we identify the cellularity. So there are two things here. One is the diagnostic, which another the surgical margins. Right. right. 
we are more interested on the surgical margins and the way we started to group for the GBM right now, the data is between no or low cellularity. We're talking about these infiltrations because I understand it's a kind of a piecemeal approach right. at the margin and see how well you can detect what is the threshold of uh, detection of, of these cells, of packets of cells. If you have high cellularity, probably can go and scoop out a few more um, cells from and see how deep you can go until you get to low or no nothing. But it's not probably removing everything because again, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but I understood that this is kind of finger, uh, sometimes pockets that will go infiltrated in the brain and probably that will be difficult to detect or remove, the question is to remove as much as possible. Yeah, no, I totally understand. I mean, we're doing work now with, with SRH and, you know, computer learning and it's, we're having the same, you know, questions of what is the threshold and how do you make those decisions and what is the gold standard? So I think it's, it's going to be good to standardize everything so we could kind of compare and contrast and really feel how these different technologies kind of complement each other for different types of tumors and, and different situations and, and, and whatnot. But this is extremely exciting work. I congratulate you guys again. And uh, I look forward to, to the clinical trial coming out and let us know if you're looking for sites to collaborate with once it does. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll love to. So uh, we'll, uh, if you have uh, patients that you can enroll as yes, we are interested on uh, cloning these devices and have more, more than one site to to work with in order to expedite uh, data collection. <laughs> yeah, in the end, it's you're right. It's all going to come to how much data you have and and how you can make that that uh, machine learning algorithm the best possible situation that it can be with the most data. So uh, happy to contribute however we can. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you again so much. We really appreciate this and uh, and uh, be safe and we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Uh, all the best. Okay. Bye. Bye.